Thank you all for coming, uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture. It's truly an honor. Uh, it brings me back my memories when I was a student uh, at Courant, uh, and I visited the UCLA cam campus for the first time from uh, NYU campus, if, you, if there is such a thing called NYU campus. So I was mighty impressed. It's such a pretty campus, and it still is, so it was fun. So thanks for inviting. <clears throat> So uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, sort of a general idea. There'll be uh, less of a, a low-level detail on the methodology, but a general idea about how uh, one can accomplish more by doing less in machine learning for healthcare, uh, especially when one is willing to step out of the box of uh, uh, the general framework that there's data set provided, you, ha you, you focus your energy on machine learning models and uh, building the machine learning models and then uh, uh, for your end, end task. This title that uh, learning signals to learn representations hopefully will become clear uh, uh, as we move along towards the end of the talk. <clears throat> but I'm hoping that these general ideas are not necessarily so, so uh, uh, are applicable to uh, radiology, but also other other aspects. Oh, oh by the way, uh, as as by the way of introduction, my name is Sumit Chopra. I'm an associate professor uh, in uh, at NYU. I have a joint position at uh, the Kuran Institute of Mathematical Sciences and also in the Department of Radiology. And uh, prior to that, uh, I uh, was a co-founder of a startup which was doing AI in radiology. And before that, I was a research scientist at. Uh, uh, Facebook, now Meta, and uh, uh, also at AT&T Bell Labs. <clears throat> so I've been doing AI for healthcare for about, I would say now, eight, seven, eight years. So, uh, so what are the goals of radiology here, right? Like, so uh, if we step back and look, uh, the the definition on the uh, on the FDA website of radiology or medical imaging in general refers to radiology as a different set of technology uh, that can be used to view the human body in order to diagnose, monitor, or treat any medical condition, right? Likewise, at NIH, radiology is referred to as a branch of medicine that uses imaging technology to diagnose and treat uh, medical conditions, right? So the end goal, of course, is you want to treat or diagnose the conditions, and the way it is done is you somehow non-invasively uh, go uh, look at what's going on inside a human body. Of course, you can't uh, cut open a person and, ta and, and, and take a picture and then seal. So you have to come up with indirect methods to do it. And the way you do it is you generate an image, and that image gets read by, by, uh, by a human radiologist, and then they uh, finally make a decision uh, whether there's something wrong or not. And we made good progress uh, towards this goal since when it all started. So this is the first uh, image of an X-ray of a hand, which was taken in 1895 by uh, this gentleman called Wilhelm uh, Conrad. And he actually won the Nobel uh, Prize for Physics in this. <clears throat> and that was the first image of the X-ray. By the way, there's nothing wrong in this image. That the blob that you see is actually the wedding ring of his wife. So this is his wife's hand. Uh, and this is what an X-ray image looks like now, right? Like highly sharp, like uh, you can see each and every bone very clearly. So if there are, if there are any subtle uh, fractures or anything else that is subtly wrong, it will be easy for a human to diagnose or uh, to, to answer. Similarly, this is the first ever image of a human chest, which was taken in 1977 using an MR machine, a magnetic resonance machine and by this person called Dr. Raymond Demadian. And in fact, he's standing in front of the machine that took this image. This is like the first ever full body MR scanner. <clears throat> and this is what a chest looks like now, where you have a lot more detail in what, what goes on inside it, including nerve endings, muscles, and, and, and other forms of tissues, right? And along the same time, uh, two other folks who ended up getting the Nobel uh, Prize for, uh, uh, for inventing MR, for some reason uh, uh, Dr. Damadian did not, were uh, uh, Sir Peter Mansfield and Dr. Paul Lauterberg. And this is what they created off with the human finger. Essentially, first ever image of a human finger using the MR machine that they created. And this is what a finger looks like now. 
Right, so clearly we made a lot of progress, uh, at least within every modality, and the and and not just we've stuck to like two modalities like X rays or MR. We've also made progress in uh, inventing new methods of how to go inside a human body. You have X rays, you have ultrasounds, you have CTs, which is primarily a three-dimensional X ray where you have a human body. Um, uh, like where you have a human laying down on this table uh, within the donut and you have an x-ray machine that essentially re uh, revolves to take pictures from different angles, which are the projections, and then they are stitched together to create the 3D image. And then of course you have R. So all throughout, the while in order to accomplish the goal of diagnosing uh, what's going on uh, or, or what's wrong with a person, uh, the the race has always been to generate better and better images, right? So the question I want to answer is, what exactly do we mean by the term better? Does better mean that the image should have a high resolution? Does better mean that the image should have a finer detail of, uh, of uh, the human anatomy? Or does better only mean that image should just be aesthetically pleasing for a clinician? Because at the end of the day, it's the clinician who will be looking at it and, uh, and, 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 and making the diagnosis. So is that the most important criteria? Or the specific question I want to answer is, like, what role does diagnostic information play in defining the term better? And here I'd like to argue that for the most part, predominantly in radiology, uh, it has gone by the underlying assumption that so long as you're able to create a really sharp, high resolution, high contrast image, uh, if you can generate that image, and also if that image is aesthetically pleasing and easy for a human to read, then it is a good surrogate for uh, sort of diagnosing a patient, whether a patient actually has a disease or not. Right. At no point during this generation of, uh, in, in this going from data acquisition in the radiology to the final answer, uh, explicitly um, the notion of diagnostic information is quantified. Or image uh, has uh, sort of a quantifiably greater diagnostic information. Right. And, 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 and to sort of uh, uh, understand this better, let's look under the hood of a specific modality, namely MR, and see and, so, and sort of understand how these images are actually generated. Right. MR, we know, is basically the gold standard of medical imaging. Right. Like it's, it's, it's by far the most sophisticated imaging modality. And it has excellent soft tissue contrast property. And by that, I mean that if you have a tissue, a, a human tissue that has slight changes, uh, to it, it is able to capture those changes by, 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 by sort of projecting them and creating an image with different shades of gray between the two, uh, two sort of types of tissues. And of course, it's a high, high resolution volumetric images. And as a result of all this, you can actually discern a large collection of pathologies uh, through a human eye. But then the question is, if, if, if MR is so good, why don't we just use MR everywhere, right? Why do we have x-rays? Why do we have ultrasounds, right? And the biggest reason why this is not being used, or in fact, the sole reason is it's, it's, it has a very limited accessibility. It is because it's just a very expensive modality. The reason for uh, high cost for MR are sort of primarily rooted into three, three factors. The first one, of course, is this hardware that you need, which is insanely, uh, it's, is insanely expensive of the order of millions of dollars. And the question might ask is, why do we need such an expensive hardware, which hopefully I'll be able to <clears throat> answer later. And then the second, of course, uh, reason for not, uh, MR not being used everywhere is it just takes a lot of time to acquire the data to create such a sophisticated image. right? A typical brain scan, for instance, could take 45 minutes to an hour where a person is put inside a claustrophobic tube and, and, and they are subjected to loud noises. And the third, of course, is that you need actually a human to actually look at these images, the subspecialist radiologist, namely. Right? And why is, uh, again, uh, to go into more detail as to why uh, sort of uh, the time of acquisition is so long, let's just go into further detail and I'm going to give you like a 30,000 feet view of what the physics behind MR image acquisition is. 
uh, like this is a very uh, brief tutorial about uh, five minutes or so, but there's a lot more detail that goes into it. And, and, and trust me, there's a very clean and nice uh, uh, underlying physics that explains all this. So here's what's happening. <clears throat> So human body is about, we know, 60 to 70 percent water. It's composed of 60 to 70 percent water. And water is, has two hydrogen molecules, and they have uh, each molecule has a proton. And these protons are basically nothing but these act like a small magnet. And when a human is not subjected to any external magnetic field, these magnets are just spinning around in their own, uh, in their own um, glory. Now, when a person goes into a, that, long tube of an MR machine, that huge tube is actually a giant magnet. So the patient is, expect, uh, is exposed to an ex a very strong external magnetic field. Right? And once that happens, there are two things that go, uh, go, go, go on with these protons who were humming along on their own, in their own merry. One is that they all get aligned in the direction of that strong magnetic field. Right? Some get aligned in the right direction where basically their poles are aligned and the others, and they have the low energy, and the others get aligned in the opposite direction where the, the, the poles are opposite and they have the high energy de denoted by these arrows, the small black arrows. And the second thing that happens to these protons is that they start to precess. Precession is like a motion of a spinning top on a, uh, on a, on a floor where essentially it is it is fixed along one axis and it's going like this, right? Uh, now, once uh, uh, these protons are processing in the direction of the magnetic field, what happens, uh, like another way to look at this thing is basically unifying this whole thing into a single uh, frame of reference where you have a collection of protons that are in the alignment which are uh, denoted on the top and they have low energy and the collection of protons that have high energy which are at the bottom and they're all processing along each other. So there's a net cancellation of magnetization among these two protons and, and, and there's net magnetization that is pointing in the direction uh, from south to north. right? And that's called the longitudinal magnetization. <clears throat> Now, when another thing, uh, I don't know whether you've been inside an MR machine or not, but if you have, you must have noticed that it also has, wh while you're inside, there's a huge loud banging noise that, uh, that you're subjected to. And those banging noise are essentially radio frequency pulses that, are being, uh, the, the, that you're being exposed to while in the machine. And when these protons, who, uh, which are processing inside you, get subjected to a radio frequency pulse, some of the low energy protons absorb the energy of the pulse and they go into a higher energy state. And the second thing that happens is that right now these protons were processing in their own phase. The second thing that happens is that they all get aligned to the same phase. So this is uh, the depiction of the protons going from high, low to high energy and this is the phase alignment and now they are all processing in the same direction. And as a result, there's a decrease in the longitudinal magnetization because some protons move from uh, north to south and increase in what we call the transverse magnetization because now everything is being aligned, uh, uh, is being uh, processing in the same phase, <clears throat> right? And now when you stop the radio frequency pulse, the reverse happens, that these protons go back uh, to, are sort of dephased and they go back to their low energy state. And as a result, as expected, the transverse magnetization decreases and the longitudinal uh, goes back up. Now, when you place an electric coil in the vicinity of these changing magnetization, essentially what happens is, as Physics 101 would say, an electric current gets generated. And it's that current that gets measured by, by, by that's basically the signal that gets measured by the machine, right? And another thing of note is protons from different tissues take different amount of time to go back to their natural state. Or in other words, the, the trajectory of the transverse magnetization going from max to zero is different for different material. For water, it takes longer. For fat, it takes, for instance, uh, much faster. And it's this difference in time that gets translated into different shades of gray on the actual image that you see. 
right? So, the, so, so these are the measurements that basically an MR machine is collecting. And these measurements are stored in this giant matrix, called, what we call the K-space matrix. And these are acquired in, uh, in, in the frequency space. And each element of this K-space matrix essentially encodes one aspect of the full image. Right? Essentially, think of it like a grid. And the biggest problem with, uh, so, 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 so the whole game of essentially collecting the data for MR is basically to populate this K-space matrix. And the trouble with uh, the whole process is that this uh, process of population is essentially a sequential process where basically you throw an uh, a, a radio frequency pulse, you take a measurement, and then you wait because you want the protons to come back to their original relaxed state, and then you measure the current, and then you throw, an, and, and that's basically one entry, effectively one entry of your K-space matrix, and then, and, and then you fill another entry, and then you fill another entry, and so on. So by, de by design, this is a sequential and a slow process. As a result, it takes about <clears throat> half an hour to 45 minutes to almost an hour to, to actually get, a, get sufficient amount of data for you to create an image. And once this K-space matrix is fully pop uh, populated, then basically image creation is a, a, a straightforward operation. You just take an inverse Fourier transform, right? <clears throat> so uh, another thing of note here is that this K-space matrix has a very specific structure to it, right? It's not like a random matrix with a, ra with a random set of entries. And as I mentioned, each element of the K-space matrix encodes some aspect of the full image, right? And here I'll show an animation where I'll start with a blank K-space matrix on the left, and I'll gradually start populating it with lines going from the center to outwards. And for every line I populate it with, I will create the corresponding image given the lines that I've populated thus far, right? So I start with a uh, single line and I see the image on the left, which is basically nothing right now, but as I'm slowly populating the matrix going uh, from inside to outside, slowly the image is, is being formed. And as you can see by now with only a handful of lines, you can at least discern that this is an image highly likely of a brain. Right? And as we move along uh, towards the outer edges of the K-space matrix, the finer details um, uh, starts to get populated within the image. Right? And another thing to note, uh, which is like a teaser for the rest of my talk, is with only a handful of amount of K-space uh, lines, you could already see that there is this white patch in this image, which corresponds to the tumor that, uh, that, that this person is suffering from. Right? So I guess my question here is, um, if basically, if hypothetically, we were merely interested in uh, answering a binary question, that whether a person has a disease or not, let's just keep aside why do we want to do that, but assuming we do it, we, we are interested in such a situation that whether a person has a disease or not, do we really need to do this much work uh, that, that, that collect the whole K-space matrix and, 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 and populate the whole K-space matrix to get this high resolution image for a radiologist to look at, right? And, 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 and let's see what the answer is. And highly likely, as the previous uh, animation said, uh, probably that is not true. Like here I'm starting with a full K-space matrix and, and I have a corresponding image and now I'll start deleting lines, which is to say that I'm not acquiring that data. And I'll start generating the corresponding image. As you can see, I, I, I delete two lines, four lines, six, eight, ten, and still by, by and large the image is intact and so is the, the, the tumor, which is shown by the red arrow, that's intact. And as I keep going, image does get uh, uh, sort of quite noisy and has a lot of artifacts for a radiologist to actually look at and make a diagnosis. But nevertheless, there is a sufficient amount of signal for say a, a downstream machine learning algorithm to infer whether the tumor is there or not, right? So yes, you can do it. But of course, like not all subsets of the K-space uh, ma matrix uh, 
uh, are the same, right? Like if I randomly sample half the lines, I may not necessarily get an image which can actually give me whether the diagno uh, a patient has uh, cancer or not, as opposed to if I do a little bit, apply a little bit more thought, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, yes and no. So the idea here is uh, this is all on retrospective data, so I've eliminated the lines randomly, but of course, like you have to be, uh, you are subjected to the physics behind the, the underlying scanner. And as a result, while you may not have the freedom to eliminate any random subset, but still you have a good amount of freedom to systematically eliminate lines uh, that are pseudo-random, so to speak. Uh, when you say related to the no so 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 radio frequency is only used to uh, generate the signal so it's finally the receiver that receives a signal which is basically the electric current and that gets translated into, uh, that's represented as a complex number, and that's one element of your, one, one entry of a case space. So it's not like direct radio frequency relation there. So your measurement is in space dimensions, and then you do Fourier transform to uh, change space, or your measurements are in the case space? Measurements are in the case space, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Cool. So, uh, so as I said, not all subsets are equal, right? And and uh, this is like uh, an example where uh, you have uh, the, the figure on the right, which is basically a, a half the case space lines, but sampled in a little more thoughtful manner. Similarly, if you have one third of the case space lines, you can still see a tumor which is as good as half the case space line, but again, have to be sampled in a thoughtful manner. Right. So this sort of points me to a more, more stronger uh, sort of notion of what I call disease signature. Or in, and, and by that I mean there has to, by, by, by looking at these simple experiments, there has to exist a minimal number of case space lines that have the maximal amount of diagnostic information pertaining to the disease. That's what I call a disease signature, like a sort of a rough course definition, but that's what it is. So the question is, can we actually learn a disease signature using some sort of a machine learning model? Where the idea would be that you first learn which parts of the case space are important for whatever disease you want to identify, and then use the same or another model to actually take only, sample only that data and finally uh, generate an answer. Right? And if you can do that, then my conjecture is that all of this can be transported from this multi-million dollar machine into a really cheap scanner, which does not require you, require a person to be inside a tube to get high quality measurements. And at the same time, you don't need that many measurements. Right? And where you're essentially directly measuring what it, what's going on inside a person and, 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 and inferring whether there's a, uh, there's a disease or not. But of course, like you might say that, what about the radiologist, right? Like we've essentially completely eliminated the images. And here I would argue that such a, such a methodology can actually help radiologists. At no point I'm saying that images are not necessary. They're absolutely necessary because once you infer whether a person has a disease or not, you also want to do other things like localization where the tumor exists and, 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 and precisely how, like what's the stage of the tumor, etc. And for that you do need a radiologist and you do need a high definition images. <laughs> Right? And like a nice clinical use case that we've been working on uh, where, where such a thing can have a huge clinical impact is uh, in this detection of a clinically significant prostate cancer. <clears throat> right? So uh, prostate cancer is the second largest, just to give you a bit, bit of a background, prostate cancer is the second largest co uh, cause of uh, death among men in the US and probably even worldwide. And the trouble with prostate cancer is like if all of, 
if all of the men in the U.S. after a certain age got their biopsies done uh, of their prostate to, to infer whether they have a cancer or not, 80% of them will find that they have cancer. But the thing with prostate cancer is that for most men who have a prostate cancer, it's like so slowly growing cancer that the person will typically die of other natural causes as opposed to cancer killing them. But then there are some subset of people for whom the prostate cancer goes significantly fast and as a result kills them. So those are the people that you want to identify and intervene on and treat the cancer. And that's what we call the clinically significant cancer, clinically significant prostate cancer. And typically to do, uh, to, to sort of identify such people, there are uh, sort of recommended uh, clinical protocols that are, uh, that have been uh, uh, established by the government and other cancer societies where basically if you have symptoms or if you are above certain age, you go get yourself a screening test done, what we call the PSA test, the prostate specific antigen test. That's basically a blood test that measures the prostate specific antigen, the, the volume of prostate specific antigen inside your blood. And if it's small, or less than some threshold, you don't do anything and you basically not treat the patient at all and you just ask them to come back maybe in an year or six months. But if it's greater than some threshold, then the patient is sent to an invasive biopsy to essentially check whether there's a cancer in the prostate or not and also a subsequent uh, MRI exam. Now the trouble with the PSA test of course is that it is extremely non-specific. Or in other words, it has a huge amount of false positive rate. So 70% of the people who are actually undergoing biopsy based on the PSA test are basically going, getting under the needle for no reason. And biopsy has its own set of risks, like risk of infection and other stuff, which is non-trivial. And of course, and they're also getting uh, an expensive MR done, which uh, a radiologist is reading and, 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 and essentially not, not necessarily the their best use of time because most of these cases are normal or non-clinically significant and of course it adds also to the cost of the health system because someone has to pay for these expensive scans right so how can we change this with with with, with the method that i just discussed so what if after the psa test if the psa test says yes you get this send the patient pay, patient to this cheap scanner and that scanner also just gives you a binary answer that no, nothing is wrong. I mean, like everything seems fine, or at least as far as clinically significant cancer is concerned, in which case you come back after a few months. Or if it says yes, only then you subject the patient to uh, the full MR and the full biopsy. And what this, of course, leads to is reduced false positives and high diagnostic yield. So in that sense, it's good for a radiologist as well, because now they're looking at interesting cases. Images are still there. Right? And note that this can actually reduce the false positives and increase the yield because, as I said earlier, and, and, and I'll show later in the experiments, by if you're resorting to only a yes-no answer, you can get accuracy which is as high as a standard MR accuracy based out of your image. <clears throat> right? So, so, so the question is then how can we do this? Right? And again, recollect the goal here is basically to infer which parts of the case space signal have a diagnostic signal for you to predict whether there's a pathology, uh, there, there's a disease or not, right? And so the question is, how do we define best here, right? So, 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 so this is the uh, essentially recall. What I said was basically. <clears throat> that not all subsets of images uh, or, or all subsets of the case space uh, have the same amount of signal with, uh, when it comes to uh, the pathology that you're interested in. And as a result, you want to find the subset that is, uh, has the most amount of information. Right? So here's how we define, uh, quote unquote, the diagnostic signal. For a given undersampling factor, the best pattern is the one which has the largest diagnostic signal. Right? And the diagnostic signal for that, uh, I'll, I'll define in the following manner. I'll first introduce a couple of notations, which is basically let S be the, the sampling pattern, and XS corresponds to the data, uh, the case space data corresponding to the sampling pattern, and Y is the clinically relevant variable. 
then essentially a diagnostic signal is defined as <clears throat> or quantified as a mutual information between X, S, and Y. Right? That is between the data and your clinically relevant variable, that is whether you have a cancer or not. So now, so we, we came up with a fairly straightforward algorithm of uh, how to essentially uh, do this thing, and we did it in two steps. Uh, there are multiple ways to do it, uh, and we're actually currently exploring other uh, more efficient ways as well. In step one, essentially what we want, or, or what we do is uh, a learn a machine learning model, uh, I guess a deep learning model, that takes as input any random sample of the case space and your Y, and estimates what your mutual information would, would look like. Right? This is what we call the value of this sample. Right? And in step two, once we have learned this network that can estimate a value for any, uh, any subset, we essentially randomly sample a collection of subsets of your case space based on certain uh, prior distribution. And the prior distribution could encode your prior knowledge as to which parts of the case space capture what type of uh, what type of signal, for instance, high frequency or low frequency and things like that. And then essentially you value each of these samples, right? And then just pick the one that has the highest value, right? So, <clears throat> So, so recall, in the end, ideally what we want to do is basically have an end-to-end -end pipeline where you have an input data and you have a machine learning model and you want to give an answer and you want to figure out which part of the input data you should, uh, you should actually collect uh, that can give you the best possible answer. Right. So, so the, way it, uh, the way it is presented here is this problem is not very different from a very standard machine learning problem called feature selection, where you have basically large quantities of data and then essentially you want to figure out which features uh, of the data are important uh, for your end task. Except that one subtle difference here is that once this gets deployed, there is no notion of full data. You don't have the full data. You want to learn which data to acquire. And that's what I mean by learning the signal that you want to acquire to learn the representations which can be used for your classification task. <clears throat> right? And here's an example of uh, uh, basically a clinically significant prostate cancer image on the left, uh, which is generated using um, the fully sampled case space data. And on the right, I have an image uh, which is sort of undersampled, uh, which is generated from undersampled case space data, and, and, and where you can see that basically the pathology is uh, completely missing. And it's a hard problem, right? So the question is can we actually detect the clinically significant prostate cancer with a fraction of a data uh, uh, as accurately as you would with a typical high resolution image? And the answer is yes. So, uh, so the black line is basically the performance of the deep learning model on the on on the NYU test set that we had <clears throat> where the model is trained on, on images generated using fully sampled case space data that's the best you can do and the red line essentially gives you the performance of uh, the technique that we just proposed uh, at different uh, sort of sampling factors so 5% means you you're only using 5% of your case space lines Right? And, and as you can see, and of course, like the the performance slightly increases as you increase the sample, uh, as you increase the number of case space lines. But again, I mean, I won't call this increase because it's within the error mark, within the error bars. But 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 at least the performance is comparable, <clears throat> right? And one might say that okay, why not try this by first generating an image using five percent of the data and then see what it does or not. And sure, we did that, and there you can see that the performance actually deteriorates if you use only 5% or, 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 or smaller amount of case space data. And uh, likewise, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, yeah. With the so 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 it's actually an even better uh, ground truth than the radiologist. It's, uh, so the ground truth is coming from the pathology reports, the the biopsies. So uh, even among the radiologists, when they look at the image, there's a huge subjectivity in terms of whether it is clinically significant or not. Like they give a pyrad score from uh, uh, one to five, 
and uh, four and five are considered clinically significant. Three also is considered somewhat clinically significant and they, 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 they refer to a biopsy, but still there's subjectivity, but this is from biopsy crown truth. So, so in terms of sensitivity and specificity as well, as, as, as we decrease the amount of data that we work with, the, the, the performance increases, uh, the performance gap at least increases. And like here are the set of uh, uh, sort of example images uh, that I'm showing where this is a full high resolution image where you can see the clinically significant cancer. Now, if I um, under sample or take only 12 and half percent of the case space lines and generate an image out of it, you see that the pathology is pretty much gone. Uh, or in other words, this is almost a human unreadable image. And, and, and even worse when you go even lower, <clears throat> right? And we showed that in our experiments that this is not like prostate cancer specific, this technique, it, it sort of generalizes to other, other areas as well. In this case, I'm showing a pathology in knee where, I don't know whether you can see or not, there's like a subtle white dot here that corresponds to some, some knee specific disease, but that dot is gone once you undersample the case space data and generate the image. Right. So the cool, so the cool thing about these ideas are that they are not just sort of applicable. They they are sort of applicable to um, any sort of scenario where you have a disease that is sort of slowly progressing and requires a continuous monitoring of a patient. Right. Like a, a like a standard. Uh, one very important example is uh, essentially Alzheimer's disease, which. Uh, uh, is basically a disease where uh, your brain tissue starts to degenerate and your brain starts to shrink. And once that uh, it's past certain threshold, like it can really impact your quality of life in terms of memory loss and stuff like that, and 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 your basic body functions, etc. So, <clears throat> and it's not necessarily a rare disease, and it 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 it's it's, it's quite prevalent. And uh, the the standard of care here is you identify high risk patients who essentially are the patient who might end up developing Alzheimer's based on their family history and other stuff. And then uh, you essentially monitor them on a regular basis. And uh, a part of monitoring essentially involves uh, the person going to an MR scanner and getting an MR exam done of their brain. And then the radiologist looks at their current image from the previous images acquired and then essentially deduces whether the rate of uh, deterioration is, uh, degeneration is is, is, is high or low and based on that they can intervene. The physician can intervene in terms of changes in lifestyle and I believe there's a recently the FDA also approved a drug that uh, uh, clean, uh, significant, uh, that, that slows down the degeneration process at least uh, statistically significantly. But for the most part what happens is, or not most part, but predominantly what happens is that the patients don't necessarily repeatedly go through MR exams on a regular basis if they are high risk. It only ends up going to a clinician once they actually start to observe symptoms. And once those symptoms uh, are sort of onset, it's already almost always too late to intervene and change the course of the disease in, or slow the disease down in some shape or form. And the primary reason for delinquency is the fact that MR is not accessible. And it's just a high friction process. So what if we have a scanner in say uh, in any typical city MD or a primary care's office where basically you go in, you just get a scan done and the scanner just says yes or no, hmm, everything seems to be fine from last time so come back after six months or maybe something is changing in your brain, just go get a full scan done, right? And that, so, so, so examples like these can significantly change how we care for patients so long as we are able to uh, sort of step out of the box and uh, use machine learning in ways that uh, are not traditionally uh, being used. Or in general, like this is basically a general framework that I'm arguing for where cur currently this is the setup where you have an input data, which is your healthcare data, could be EHR, could be images or, or, or whatever. And then you have a machine learning model, which is basically the, the sole learning module in your pipeline, which uh, you essentially focus most of your energy on to uh, solve your final task. But what I'm arguing for is basically make your learning module 
to also include the data. Basically, learn what data you need to acquire for a subsequent machine learning model to give the best possible answer. So yeah, so that brings me to the end of my talk. So uh, the short story is that uh, um, good things can happen if one is willing to break away from the conventional way of how we do machine learning for healthcare. And uh, less can actually get you more. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>